Dodd Schrank, a former president of the Overseas Press Club and of the Overseas Press Club Foundation. So it's really nice to have the media line here uh, putting on this wonderful event because we share a couple of really important goals. The one is to assure the world that it has a free flow of information of, of facts. I, I don't want to be redundant and say real facts. <laughs> just facts and uh, news. And we also care greatly about educating young people to become competent professional journalists who can help the rest of the world understand what's going on. And to that end, uh, the Overseas Press Club Foundation um, now sponsors 15 fellowships. And uh, Felice and I have talked about this. And uh, as you do, we try to teach these young people how to report and how to stay safe. And so um, I know that Neil Barrow is going to do all the introductions, but I want to welcome uh, the founders of Media Line, Elise Friedson. And one with, did I pronounce that right? Okay. And her husband, and Marvin Cow, a veteran newsman, Peter Yarrow, and Art and Shirley Sotloff, who whose son is a, a, a monument to trying to tell the world the truth. And uh, so I welcome everybody, and now I'll turn it over to Neil. And, and thank you very much for coming. And if you take a look at opcofamerica.org, you can find out more about us and our mission and how it overlaps with yours. Thank you. I had a distinct pleasure of meeting Felice and Michael on November 7th, 2016. And I want to tell you this whole convergence, politics, media, technology, I think the entire world, you don't have to be in journalism to understand the power of communication, the power of facts versus something that's not. At the heart and soul of the media line, at the heart and soul of the mission of Felice, at the heart and soul of, of the mission of Michael, it's a commitment to an honest brokering to find the truth, to work with people of all sides, to be independent, to do it as a not-for-profit, to do it in the Middle East, to work years ago in the creation of a journalism press association that brought Palestinian and Israeli journalists together in common gathering and in common cause. And Felice has spent time working professionally in Yemen with the Palestinian Authority and of course in Israel as well and her staff, of which the media line has brilliantly served as a training ground of the highest order for people who will go on to distinguish careers in and out of journalism, whether it's in government, in business, they will serve with a background training of integrity. And to associate the media line with integrity, I would argue, is the highest calling of compliment. And I want to say to that regard, you will hear tonight, not just from extraordinary luminaries, but allow me to say with some frank prejudice, young people of the highest order who reflect the values and concepts of what is attempted to happen now and in the future. And I will simply say as a career person in the world of advocacy and not the profit, I want to advocate for the strength and continuation of the media line. May it go from strength to strength with great thanks to the Overseas Press Club, with great thanks to all of you, with great thanks to every person who's part of a message that says we need facts more than ever. And with that, let us graciously welcome the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Media Line, Ms. Felice Friedson. Well, thank you, everyone. And nice to see familiar faces. I first want to take a moment, and I want to just acknowledge Deidre Depke and Patricia Krantz, who could not be with us, uh, President and um, Assistant Associate Executive of the Overseas Press Club. They had some personal things they had to take care of, so they couldn't be here. Alan, where is Alan? Here you are. Thank you very much oh, for our honor. opening this evening. And this evening is quite important. We have really true friends here, 
who have been involved with the media line for a long time, Marvin Kelp. I can't tell you how many years we've bothered you with many, many detail in terms of journalism and ethics. Peter Yarrow, a dear friend of ours, on issues which you'll learn tonight, which intertwine policy as well as media, and we'll talk about that a little later. The Sotloffs, where Stephen Sotloff, as we all know, gave his life. It was a horrific, horrific event in the history of the United States. And Stephen did spend his last few years of his life working with the media line, and we'll talk about that later. Esteemed young people, our, our journalists this evening, some are journalists, some aren't, who've come, who've spent time in interning in the media line and how that's impacted their lives. Thank you for being here and coming from different parts of the United States. I know you made an effort and it was very important. And of course, Michael Friedson, who is my co-partner in crime and journalism. And I want to acknowledge as well, Jack Baxter, Bram, and Barry Rubin, and Jerry Rhodes, because I'm involved in um, a film co-producing. These are the executive producers of the film that they're in the midst of doing. They've been all over Europe looking for moderate voices in terms of issues of terror. And the documentary is called The First, The Last Sermon, excuse me. So I think it's a very important and timely documentary, and hopefully we'll all get a chance to see where that ends up. We just spent some time in London, and I think it was very interesting to be part of that film and interview some very key people. This evening, it's all about journalism and the demise of journalism. And frankly, folks, many of us are disgusted when we look at the media today and try to understand what is going on. I tell you that our forefathers would turn in their graves. You know, I think about Thomas Jefferson and the things that he said in terms of journalism. He'd rather give up government, he said this, than if there were not a free press. And where are we today if we don't have a press that's not just free, but a press that's reliable and responsible? It's not a one-way track in terms of journalism. It's about journalists living up to what's important and also doing their jobs well. And I hate the word bias, folks, but bottom line is about being complete. That's what we teach our students. It's about showing all narratives in a region that is so darn difficult, the Middle East, and that's what we cover. Journalism is my passion, to tell the story one story at a time, with context, with sources, which we don't often see today. And I know, Marvin, many, many times we talk about the importance of press and policy and how they come together and they merge. Marvin Kalb, all of you know, handpicked by Edward R. Murrow and the team many years ago in terms of what is classical journalism, how we make a dent in every one of our lives in reshaping how we see communications, how we see business, how we see technology, how we see human rights issues. We've lost something, folks. We've lost something in terms of how the public understands media, and we've lost something in terms of going into journalism school after journalism school and seeing very often that there's something missing in terms of the complete contextual story. We have now trained about four dozen young students, internships in Jerusalem, over a decade. Many of them are sitting in leading newsrooms. You're gonna meet some of them later. Some of them have gone on to policy. Some of them are going on to business. Some are still figuring out where they're going. One young woman who we just finished training in our office just this week is going to be the editor of her school newspaper in DePaul University. And it's exciting to see where these young people start and where they end. I'm not saying it's easy, they'll tell you. Sitting in our newsroom is quite a task because we care. We wanna see leadership students making a difference. So we said, how can we really reshape journalism and do it with impact so we decided that after all these students were coming our way, how could we make a difference and turn that around? And what we created was a remote distance learning program 
where we called 500 universities three years ago and said, what if we created a leadership program where we actually had an opportunity to mentor one-on-one -on -one students with journalists like Michael Friedson, and journalists that work in our bureau, whether they're in Egypt or they're in, sitting in Jerusalem. We even have a young woman now we're training from Ramallah who went to Grizzit University, and she said, I want to train. Well, she's training herself right now and learning the ropes. But the reality is that we have 50 universities interested in this program, and today we proudly can say, as we launch this right here at the Overseas Press Club, that we have six universities around the globe that have partnered with the Media Line. Our first pilot program was with Florida Atlantic University. We just came off of that now. And interesting, there were students that worked on this very, very hard, and sometimes they were very busy, tasked with other classes, and you had to find that fine line of how do you work with them remotely. And yet, you will learn this evening how some of them have risen to that occasion. They have risen past any imaginable dream and actually conquering some of the most difficult tasks that one can imagine in journalism. Living in the Middle East is not easy. It means covering Israel. It means covering the Palestinian territories. I myself was in Yemen a month before the the Arab Spring, and Sonia Fry can attest to that because I spoke here with Nadia Al-Sakaf, who was an editor of the Yemen Times, who, by the way, cannot come to the United States today because of the list that we see uh, as far as barring anyone from Yemen here today. And I'm actually writing a book with Nadia Al-Sakaf, and she said, well, how am I going to come to the United States and I'll speak with you? So we'll wait and see. We'll have to see. But here, we're Filming this as we speak tonight, so many people will have that opportunity to, to hear and to learn about what journalism should be. Marvin, I'd like to bring you up, and I think that it's not just that you head the Shorenstein Center for Press and Policy, it's not just that you are a, um, a Murrow professor at Harvard for all these years, that everyone has seen your face between CBS and NBC and Am I missing anything? Fox, um, meet the press. But I think what's important is that you have been a leader in merging press and policy, and the two are intertwined. And the question one always asks is what pushes what? Does press move policy? Does policy move press? Are we just pawns in the process? These are questions that we're always mulling over as journalists. Without much ado, I'd like to bring you up to talk and elaborate about our deep dilemmas that we encounter today in journalism. Thank you very much, Felix. Uh, I'm a great fan of the media, so let that be noted from the very beginning. What I want to say, I think, uh, will have to take us back a couple of years. In May of 1957, I was a graduate student at Harvard. I was intent on a PhD in Russian history. Um, I had just come from spending a year at the American Embassy in Moscow. Um, I learned the language very well. I was a kind of junior press officer at the American Embassy. I translated the Soviet press. I sharpened Ambassador Boland's pencil. I did anything they wanted. Um, and I was thrilled with the assignment. Because what it meant is that at the height of the Cold War, I was able, as a student of Russian history, to see it, to feel it, to talk to Russians um, all over the country. And when I came back, I went back up to Harvard, intent on finishing my degree. And in May, I got a call, um, and Felice has already given the story away, I got a call from Ed Murrow. Um, he called twice that day. The first day that he called, a librarian came to me, I was a wife at a library, and she said, well, there's a guy on the phone, he says he's Edward R. Murrow. <laughs> um, would you talk to him, please? And I said, Edwin Amaro is not calling me. Hang up on me. He's obviously a nut. Forget it. <laughs> and she came back at about five in the afternoon and she said, He's called again, and I really think 
you want to talk to him. Curious, I picked myself up, picked up the phone. The minute I heard his voice, I realized what a total jackass <laughs> I was. How could you play games with Ed Murrow? And he said, I just read the article that you had in the Times last week. I liked it very much. I'd like you to come down and, and talk to me about Russia. Yes, sir, I said. Nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Yes, sir, I'll be there. And as I was going in, his secretary, Kate Campbell, said, uh, remember, he's a very busy man, a half hour, and that's it. I said, yes, ma'am, half hour. Three hours later, <laughs> the meeting ended, and it took that long because Murrow was intensely interested in the story. He wanted to know what was going on in Russia. He wanted to know about Nikita Khrushchev. Who is this guy? What does he want? Will he settle for what? And I answered as best I could. Um, toward the end, Murrow said to me, how would you like to work for CBS? He said, yeah. I said, I've never been a reporter. Uh, I've never been a broadcaster. I don't know if I can do it. Oh, he said, sure. Not, not at all. His left string to that, and he took out from his drawer a bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label Scotch, and he put two large glasses there. It's about 11 in the morning. <laughs> and he began to pour. And he looked at me, and there must have been a look on my face of absolute shock and horror. And he said, you don't drink. I said, no, does that mean there's no job? <laughs> he said, no, but it does make things that much more difficult. <laughs> but he did offer the job. I did accept, and I stayed at CBS for 24 years, and then seven years at NBC before accepting a job of starting the Shorenstein Center at the Kennedy School. I happen to think that that period of time, having nothing to do with me, coincident with that period of time, was the golden age of, of American journalism. As we know it today, it was a time where, that was not only inspired by people like Murrow, but we were in the middle of the Cold War. It was a great story. We all knew that we had to understand what was going on in the Soviet Union and what was in Nikita Khrushchev's head and Leonid Brezhnev. And when we read about the horrible things going on in a communist system of government, we wanted to know more about it. And when I had an opportunity to go up to Harvard to start the center, I really grabbed it for two reasons. One, the concept of trying to study the way in which the media influences public policy and the way, in fact, there can be in our current environment no public policy without the infusion of a vibrant press. The two go together. Unless you understand that, you're missing the point of the way in which we govern ourselves. And at, at that point, I was saying to myself, thinking back, what was it about those years, those 30, 40 years? And I keep going back to one point. We were absorbed in a major issue. We wanted to survive the threat, the challenge of communism, and we did. And communism was the thing that collapsed, not capitalism. So what happens now if that battle has, in a sense, been won? Where do we turn today? And what's interesting is that Russia is coming back into the picture. And given the nature of American politics, it is back in a big way into how we govern ourselves, what is the role of a president in terms of a Russian connection, if there is one. I happen to think there is, but that's irrelevant to where I'm going. I feel that we are now faced with another very large challenge compounded by two elements having to do with journalism. The first has to do with money, old-fashioned ingredient, money. Where do you get it to do the best that you can in journalism? <clears throat> I remember that when I was covering the plot to kill the Pope, Pope John Paul II, and we were in Rome, 
I was at NBC at that time. I had two camera crews. I was there as the, the correspondent. And the man who shot the Pope was a man named Mehmet Ali Adja, and his mother lived in the eastern corner of Turkey. And one morning I get up and I said to myself, I am determined to get to that village today. I've got to talk to her today. Why today? Who knows? In my mind, I had to see her today. And what did I do? I charted a plane. And I took the cruise, and we flew to the eastern end of Turkey, and we got the interview. I never had to check with NBC. I, on my own, did that. It cost many thousands of dollars. I'm still when Mr. Tucker, <laughs> one of my great friends, that was the time still when the quest for news was so central to the network that if you had to spend the money, you spent it, but you got the story. That was the key. That is over, finished, forget it. Now every single news program goes with a person who manages the budget. And we've got to be very clear about where are you going to get the money, how are you going to spend it, why are you going to spend it. You've got to check with somebody who is not a journalist. But you've got to check with that person nonetheless. And very often, that person will say, no, it is too expensive. So you have that kind of constraint on the quest for journalism. Above and beyond that, we now have the internet. The internet has had a profound impact on all of journalism. Everywhere you turn today, the idea of the internet is central to the way in which we get information and the way in which we communicate with one another. And that has, in my opinion, coarsened what was once a beautiful honest pursuit of fact. Today, we live at a time when money and technology will end up determining what is on the air or what is published. I'm not saying that this is for all stories, and I'm not saying this is an every single day factor, but it's there. And journalists today are aware of it. And the amazing thing to me is that despite that, we are still producing some of the best young journalists around. It is a marvel for me. I see them. I'm with the Pulitzer Center in Washington. At the Pulitzer Center, we have a group of about 20 young people there with us at all times. But there are groups coming in. And I'm amazed. They are the same as I remember from the old days. But they're going to have to function in today's environment. So how do you do that? How do you put into their heads that there is something still beautiful about the quest for knowledge, fact, information? How do we get along in the world at all if we don't have the fact to back up our judgment of what's going on? So I end up, even with the pressures of the money and the pressures of the internet, and the new technology and social media and all of that stuff, I still end up on the optimistic side because I see these young people come in every day and they're terrific. And they're going to carry the load. It's much more difficult for them now than it was for me in my time. But somehow or another, I'm absolutely persuaded that they're going to do it. They're going to pull it off and we're all going to be the better for it. Um, I could go on, actually, for another 40 minutes, <laughs> but I am told to knock it off. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So now, I'd like to bring up our students, alumni. Please join us. Exciting to have you here 
in New York, the Overseas Press Club. And each one of you have had a very interesting journey, I think, in the media line at the Bureau. And I want to share some of the stories with the audience and tell them a little bit about who you are. So I think we're going to begin with Liana first. And Liana Baker came to us about 11 years ago, and she had two internships with the Media Line. Liana now is with Reuters. She's a business writer. And Liana, how did that impact where you are today? My first journalism internship was at the Media Line, and that's how I got my foot in the door before I was even in college. It's really hard to get an internship where you're producing stories. You're not just fetching coffee um, on day one. At the media line, I was, you know, sent out there reporting. So just to get that confidence so early on in my career was really, really helpful. When we spoke on the phone, we talked a little bit about how you went to cover the Olympics and how often you'd have to cold call people in order to get a story, or how you would address people when you're speaking to them. And the whole use of the medium of radio was really important. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So I think in my first week at the media line, uh, the editor said, Leanna, you know, there's the Lebanon wars happening. It was in 06. Get some uh, members of the Knesset on the phone. See what they have to say. It's like, I'm like, what? We could like call politicians up. Turns out they have a lot to say. They always want to talk to reporters. But just having to call up their offices was really, really, um, great just for a student to know that people want to listen to you and um, that was probably an eye-opener and now as a reporter at Reuters covering mergers and acquisitions I'm really working the phones all day long cold calling bankers trying to get information out of people and that's something that I, I first learned with you guys. Katie Byer last summer was with us and she joined us for several months she wrote 50 stories almost a story a day, which is not an easy feat, mind you. Yeah. <laughs> and she didn't come from journalism. And Katie, we too talked a little bit about what you were going to maybe say tonight. And you said you wanted to talk about a certain story that you wrote about. Yeah, so probably about a month into my internship, I ex explained to Felice that I was really interested in press freedom. Um, and she suggested that be my first feature article where I studied press freedom, sorry, in the Middle East, um, choose a couple of countries, find a journalist, find a couple of journalists, and talk to them about where the state of the, of the press is right now in the Middle East. Um, and that was my first sort of dip, that was my first sort of dip into journalism, like the real cold calling, getting people on the phone, um, type of journalism where I found a couple of think tanks, a couple of NGOs. I found one guy who we'll call Ahmed, who had worked in Syria and Israel and the Palestinian territories and Egypt. I found another journalist from Oman and it was just, it was a really interesting experience because it was my first time, you know, utilizing like social media, for instance, to get people on the phone and just, you know, I. I, I joke with Felice that I racked up quite the international phone bill and I had like a permanent <laughs> kick in my neck like this from all the time I spent on the phone. But it was my real first dip into you know, learning how to research, be inquisitive, synthesize that information, and then you know, learn how to impart it. Now, Katie was coming to us from Rice University and Liana from Northwestern, and Asaf just graduated, Asaf Silver Park just graduated Dartmouth. And we had an interesting summer where you interned at the Media Line. Right. And ISIS was un unraveling, and um, you know, ISIS was coming into play in terms of what they were doing. And we actually tried to reach out to some of the uh, terrorists to see if you were able to actually get off uh, going through Turkey right. and see if there was a way that you could actually join ISIS. Right. So, you know, the others were talking about cold calling and being shocked that that's what they have to do kind of the first day in the job. I was uh, joking with Felice that uh, the Mossad must be after your computers because after that summer I spent with you and the things I was Googling and the kind of connections that I was making online, someone must have tracked you guys. Um, but Felice comes in and says, you know, all these people, and this is way before the migrant crisis kind of became this uh, big topic that everyone covered, but Felice comes into the newsroom and says, you know, I think this is a big issue, and I think 
that it's really interesting to start thinking about how people are moving across borders and whether it's easy or hard or anyone's tracking or monitoring this. Um, and seeing as you, you know, read and write Arabic, could you just try to, through Facebook and social media, reach out to, to a recruiter? Pretend you're someone who's based in London and you want to make your way into Syria and I want to see how far we'll get. And we got pretty far, surprisingly. Too far. Um, it was actually <laughs> quite shocking. I think coming in, having never done anything related to journalism, just sitting in front of a computer and trying my best, um, we got pretty far. We were contacted by a lot of people and it really provided us a lot of insight as to how this kind of movement and flow of people happens and, and how easy it is and how, um, you know, how surveillance doesn't really exist in the virtual space, at least not then. Um, we got specific information about different um, people to contact on the ground, how the crossing of the border from Turkey to Syria actually happens, what towns people stay at, even even hotels that were recommended where where the you know the person at the reception desk could help you and provide you with information, um, and all that was really really shocking to see, um, but really helpful in putting together these stories. Actually, it was very ironic because one of the hotels that we contacted was a hotel at the border where Stephen Salwaf had been. So, and it's amazing that these things were not really there tracked at that time. Right. Liana, so in looking back, and it's very difficult, you know, go back 11 years now and trying to track some of those stories, but is there something that stands out in terms of the story that made a difference as you were writing it? I know you covered a lot of politics. Right. <coughs> Um, as part of the internship, uh, at the time the Lebanon war was a big story in 06, so you had me look at some of the sectarian strife in Lebanon and how uh, there's different, you know, sects of Muslims and Christians, and I wrote sort of an explainer on that, and that sort of was a whole new subject for me, and that's where you guys are really great, finding these stories in the Middle East that no one else is covering, you know, where could you read an explainer on the groups in Lebanon? So uh, that stood out for me, you know, coming from, from Canada and the U.S. Katie, let's look at the Hamas story. And you actually said, wow, I interviewed a Hamas member. Now, I know we all take this for granted. We're interviewing Hamas members every day, but for Katie, that was a big deal. Um, yeah, so that's another sort of human rights related story that I wrote um, and press freedom related story. There was a human rights watch report that came out about how the PA and Hamas have been abusing Palestinian journalists. And I was like, Felice, my God, I gotta write about this. And she was like, okay, okay, go ahead. And I had interviewed somebody at Human Rights Watch and I had interviewed somebody else in Israel. And this time, the rule about having two sources for the story was not gonna be enough. And so I remember going over to our bureau chief's desk and quietly stealing the foreign press contacts book <laughs> and starting to flip through it. And I'm like, who am I going to call? Who am I going to call? And I land on um, like a Hamas spokesman. And I'm like, I'm just going to call him. And I pick up the phone, dial, and the next thing I know, I'm talking on the phone with somebody from Hamas. And I was, I have no idea what I said to him. It was just like solely running on adrenaline. Um, but I remember after that being like, wow, the story now has every side it needs and I can write it. And um, I think that was just probably the most exciting moment for me as a journalist working for you. It was very, it was just, I mean, who at 22 could say that they spoke to Hamas? Mm -hmm. She wears that very clearly. <laughs> Asaf. Asaf does something very interesting since he was with us, and he actually speaks Arabic, English, and Hebrew fluently. And he, to this day, for the last few, three years, has been writing news from the Arab press which is not only on our site, but it's picked up by newspapers in different places. And it's in the magazine section of the Jerusalem Post each and every week. Some people say it's absolutely their favorite. Why don't you tell us about what you do each week? Wait, so it's actually a pretty fun task. Um, I kind of skimmed the Arab media throughout the week, um, other than reading news from Israel, Palestinian territories in the US. I also kind of keep an eye out for uh, different um, pieces of news that come out from the Arab world. So I read newspapers from Egypt, from um, Syria, from Lebanon, from Iraq, um, from the Gulf, and kind of try and see if um, there are different trends that I could identify or, or different kind of uh, pieces of news that are, are interesting and, and, and newsworthy. Um, and then at the end of the week, I kind of gather five 
of the most interesting pieces and compile them into um, little snippets and, and then that gets published together in English, translated into English, kind of allowing readers at the Jerusalem Post to see what the Arab world, um, kind of what, what the current trends are in the Arab world, perspectives about what's happening in Europe, in the US and Israel, um, very quickly and in a very informative way. So Any preview for this week? And the preview this week is actually interesting. I was just talking to, um, we all just met today, the other interns, and um, I, I say that most of the times there's so much to write about because there's so many things happening across the Middle East that I have to kind of push stuff aside. But this week was really interesting because everyone was writing about the same thing, and that was the boycott on Qatar. Um, so the recent decision of many Gulf states to kind of boycott Qatar, not send um, any of their uh, civilians over there, not allow um, airlines to land there. Um, and it was really interesting. I think this was actually quite a kind of a quintessential media line experience because I was bringing a story from Al Jazeera saying, you know, why this is horrible, and then bringing one from Egypt saying why this is amazing, and then bringing one from um, El Shark El Aousa, which is kind of this pan Arab newspaper in London saying why, why both sides really need to be more careful and how this could um, impact the US um, and its relationship with the Gulf. So it's always really interesting to see how these different narratives come together and how one story that we often pick up on uh, could really be portrayed in different ways across the world. Well, I think the word narrative is very key and it's something that we really have to be connected to. It's very important because if you don't see most narratives in a story, then it's missing something. Most people don't spend the time to actually fact check. Fact-based news is our motto. Trusted news is our motto. And the reality is it takes a lot of time. You can't always be first to get there. And it's hard. Any questions from the audience before we close with our really stellar young people here? Yeah. Why do you want to be a journalist? Well, we have one if definitely who is a journalist, Mark Marvin. Not everybody wants to be a journalist. No, no, I said if you want right. to. It's, I've always wanted to be a journalist from eighth grade on, uh, which is why I pursued an internship at the Media Line before I was even in college. And I think it's just something in your gut. You publish that first story and then you just get hooked. So I couldn't see myself doing anything else. I had the chance to speak with you earlier tonight, Marvin, and I, it, it was a great honor sitting here and listening to you. But it really resonated with me. You know, I, I, my life dream is to do policy and to do politics. And I see the two as very, very related. And I think that one of the things I learned from Michael Police and the other people in the newsroom is really this idea that there isn't a single truth. It's about completeness. It's about providing different um, narratives to the same story. And it couldn't be more important um, than in political work and in policy work. So that is what I want to pursue. And while it's not journalism, I think it's very much anchored in there, in that way of thinking. I think for me, um, when I was a kid, my nickname was 20 questions because I was always just like, okay, and, and, and just wanted more and more and more information. And journalism just allowed me to be like the keeper of all of that information and then the synthesizer of it. Um, and while I'm not quite sure if journalism is going to be the path that I go down, I think the, the skill set of learning how to do really good research learning how to synthesize that research and that information, and then learning how to impart it correctly was a really wonderful skill set to learn at the media line. So you still ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> what are the stories you'd like to do next? I cover mergers and acquisitions in the tech media and telecom space, so <laughs> it's very specific, but I love breaking news. That's another thing that I learned at the media line was that we're not just uh, summarizing stories, even if we summarize stories, but right. those are ones that are hard to get to. Uh, but yeah, setting the agenda by breaking, uh, for me, it's impactful stories to, for the market. That's what I really um, want to do more of. I think the next story would, that would be fascinating to do would be to look a little more closely at ISIS in Libya and North Africa. Um, now that it's kind of uh, retracting and, and moving away from the Levant um, and seeing what's going to happen there next. Okay. I want to do any human rights related story. I feel like I've made that pretty evident as my interest in what might be, I guess. Well, I want to thank all three of you for coming and making an effort and I wish you a lot of
times are great for a song with Peter Yarrow. <laughs> <laughs> And what's important here is we have to take a moment because Peter always takes everything to a different level. I'm, I'm good on this. This is fun. Don't have to do it. Okay. And I don't have to introduce Peter because everybody knows Peter. <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's an honor, but it's also an important uh, responsibility for me to to share my enthusiasm and my uh, admiration for the work of the media line. And to note that in a world where uh, the antithesis of what the media line represents has become the ordinary modality of so much of uh, the, the news that's being shared, and that it's, it's also become um, um, mechanized in, to, in terms of box so that uh, the intention to disrupt the ability not just to be able to get accurate, truthful, balanced narratives is, is, is it, it, not only is that becoming more, more difficult, but to destabilize the ability of people to, as citizens, help to create a policy by virtue of their weighing in is, is what is happening. That there is, um, it's increasingly difficult for the ordinary citizen to have the, the raw material to, um, to make decisions and to, to resonate in their hearts with, with what it is that's being uh, shared so that they come to a conclusion we can't have a democracy unless people can uh, synthesize information and um, and and say here I stand and now we have the kinds of appeals that destroy even that impulse whereby it's um, it's so much a matter of, of embracing this kind of tribal side of, 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 the, of the divide rather than being open to discourse, to dialogue, to, to sharing of, of perspectives, understanding another point of view, and being um, a, a, a human being that can that can function in a world that desperately needs the kinds of review of policy that will allow us to to get out of what is a terrible terrible situation here. When uh, I was a, a big um, advocate for Eugene McCarthy, and, and that takes me back to many years, and he was a great um, a person who saw the, the overview in, in a few frequently humorous ways that he would describe. And before he passed away, I, I married his, his niece, and I wrote his campaign song, and I stayed close to him. And uh, he was asked not long before he, he passed away by my uh, daughter, uh, what do you think is the greatest threat to America? And he said something that relates to what we're discussing. Stupidity, he said. Yeah, and those people that feed well, whether it's stupidity or ignorance or confusion, so that something is happening in this administration that is so fascinating and so mesmerizing that the substance of what is going on and the context is obscure. That's a very sophisticated kind of, of infusion of ignorance, of, of inability to know. Well, in the midst of all this, 
where does a person like myself stand that sings songs that presumably in the history of Peter Paul Mary bring people's hearts together to be able to mobilize, whether it's in the civil rights movement or the or the, the anti-Vietnam War movement or the anti-apartheid movement or the women's movement or the climate movement today. You name the movement, we've been singing in it and about it. And my feeling is that there is a certain truth in emotional resonance that uh, in which we can trust people in a certain way to have a sense of humanity when they share a musical moment. And I want to share that with you. But I have to, before I do, tell you one very short story about why the media line is really important and has made a huge difference in my life and in the Middle East. When I met Michael and Felice, I had a program at the time in the United States that is an educational, uh, social and emotional learning program called Don't Laugh at Me in a, a nonprofit called Operation Respect. And the idea was that we would allow children to grow up in an environment that was filled with caring and, and, and acceptance of differences and recognition of feelings and the tools to control and mobilize one's own self-esteem and feel the joys and the pleasures and the, and the gifts of, of helping and reaching out to, to, to others in the classroom, in the school. And this was, it was viewed as an anti-bullying program, but it, it was anti-bullying by creating a positive environment. Well, I was, I was approached by uh, somebody in the Ministry of Education in Israel, said, we've heard about your work. By the way, we're now at 22,000 schools across the United States. We've been doing this for over 20 years. And she said, uh, we heard about the work that you're doing, and we need that because of the troubles in our schools. Can you please uh, allow us to use your curriculum? We want to translate it into Hebrew, into Arabic. And we never copyrighted it. We never charged for it. It was always to be shared in a democratic fashion. This should never be subjected to, to, to monetary considerations. And we said, sure. And we were on our way because she said, you know the statistics on bullying and violence, emotional and physical violence in Israel are twice as And then her party got voted out and she was gone. <laughs> but we didn't have the money to do this. I met Michael and Felice. Comes the Lone Ranger. <laughs> there was an outbreak of violence in Akko, where they, the Arabic population, mainly a Palestinian uh, derivation, uh, and Jewish population, had lived in relative equanimity for, for a long time. And all of a sudden, violence broke out. And it was shocking. But with a, for a person with the kind of perception and understanding that Felice has, it was not shocking at all. She said, if you have children going to school in which they are said, taught, that school, that's on your land, not, my, uh, not their land. It, 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 the opposite of the Woody Guthrie song, this land is your land, this land is your land. This land is not 
your their land, this land is your land. Ultimately, this kind of reality is going to cause conflagration. Yeah. And you should look into Peter Yarrow's mentioned by name program called Operation Respect. Ambassador Cunningham from the United States saw the op-ed piece that was simultaneously published in Al Quds and the Jerusalem Post, which is, you know, groundbreaking. Looked into it, did the uh, due diligence, and then contacted us and said, we're going to fund, you're going into four schools in Israel, two Arabic schools, to uh, 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 Jewish schools. Most of the schools in Israel are divided in that way. And we're going to, and we had to translate the curriculum, not only literally, but culturally. And all the songs, we had basic songs. We, we did the basic song, like Blowing in the Wind, uh, not perhaps the magic track. No. <laughs> As we shall overcome, we have all the flowers gone. Uh, this little life of mine, I'm going to lay down my sword shield, etc. I had to record them with David Broza singing the, the, the Arabic, Amal Merkis singing the Arabic version. We had, and then we went to the, these four schools, Amal Merkis and I and David and the Voices for Peace, and it was, it was a pilot beginning. We went from four schools to 20 schools to uh, 60 schools to 100. We are now in 63% of all the schools in Israel, both in, in, uh, in the Jewish schools and in the Arabic schools. Of course, they have a few hand-in-hand -hand schools, which are, they have joint uh, leadership in, in both Arabic and uh, Jewish schools. And now we are in Nablus. I just came back from Nablus working with the education of the heart, which is what we're doing. That's not education of the academics. Of the heart, the social and emotional and the self-esteem for these kids who are in that that refugee camp that started in 1948, that, uh, where they're now three, four generations of kids. And the main focus of their efforts, because the suffering in the, that refugee camp is so great, is to try to prevent the pandemic of mental illness. There is a kid that comes in every day, and I saw him spits at the teacher and they just love me. And I walked in to the school, to this place. It's a TYO, Tomorrow's Youth, and it's, it's an organization and it's subsidized by the um, by an American nonprofit. And they sang to me. They had 70 people on staff who have the graduate degrees and their volunteers because they cannot find work and 10 that are employed. And they, this, I walked in and the kids sang our anthem, Don't Laugh at Me, in Arabic and English. I mean, and that, so and that's our base point, and now we're going out. And not that we haven't been a little bit there before. Okay, so let me now sing the song. But let me tell you that if you could say, how have you in your life seen? journalism move policy if that's not policy human policy of teaching what is essentially peace education to kids happening because somebody saw the overview of the situation and excited the in the the investigation of it and turned it into something that actively changed something on the ground I've, in all the work that I've ever done, I've never seen that happen. And now it's an appropriate time to once again acknowledge the media line, and specifically Felice Friedson, who wrote this op-ed piece.
for this, and it deserves a, a round of applause. They say that the tree of love shine on me again. They say it grows on the bank of the river of suffering. Shine on me again. So we weave, weave, weave the sunshine out of the falling rain. We be the hope of the new tomorrow. Fill my cup again. I sing we 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 be the sunshine out of the falling rain. We be the hope of the new tomorrow. Fill my cup again. We 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 be the sunshine. Try it with me. We, 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 the sunshine out of the fall. We be the hope of a new tomorrow. We be the hope of a new tomorrow. Fill my cup again. Say with me. We, 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 me, the sunshine out of the fall and rain. It's logical, too. <laughs> we be the hope of a new tomorrow. Fill my cup again. Try it again now. We, we, we out of the falling, out of the falling rain. We need the hope. We need the hope of a new tomorrow. Fill, fill my cup again. You don't have to sing, but I want to see your lips move. <laughs> we, we, we need the sunshine out of the falling rain. We need the hope. We need the hope of a new tomorrow. So Fill my cup again. Imagine what that means in our time. We need the sunshine out of the falling rain. Take the falling rain and turn it into sunshine. We need the hope of the new tomorrow. Fill my cup again. Okay, say it with me now or sing it. We, we, we need the sunshine out of the falling rain. We need the hope of the new Again, you're not anonymous. I can see we, we, we need the sunshine out of the fall. We need the hope of a new tomorrow. Listen to this next verse. I've seen the steel and the concrete crumble. Shine on me again. The proud and the mighty, they have all been humbled. Proud and the mighty have all been humbled. Soon, soon, O oh Lord, soon. Shine <laughs> on me again. We, we, we need the sunshine. We need the hope of a new tomorrow. Fill my cup again. I know that takes a lot of energy. We, <laughs> we, we need the sunshine. How oh, they're falling into the rain. Clap, clap if you can't understand. Give me the hope of a new tomorrow. Fill my cup again now, now, now. Only you can find me. Shine on me. If you want to drink at the golden fountain, you can shine, 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 shine on me again now. We bleed, we bleed. Give me the 
Stephen Satwa. And I have to say that I don't think I'm very happy to say that we all know Stephen Satwa. And yet, we've had, Michael and I had amazing experiences spending time with Art and Shirley, um, particularly this past year, and getting to know the background of, Pete, of um, sorry, Stephen much more. And thank you, Peter. And it wasn't easy knowing what he did for humanity. You know, he came to the media line in 2009. He wanted a full-time job, and we wouldn't give it to him. You know, we looked at him and said, you want to go all over the Middle East, but you've never been through the Middle East. And he was a bright young man who wanted to go and report what was happening in the region. And he came back in 2000. It was uh, 12. He emailed, and he said, Felice, I've been to Yemen and Bahrain and Egypt and Syria. And at that point, I felt it was really important to have him work for the media line as a freelancer. It was a big responsibility, and nobody was really entering into many of those countries. And it was direly important to be able to convey what was happening that the world didn't understand. He had an amazing ability, an amazing ability, to look at news in terms of what was happening. And I look back again at some of his stories and I wanted to share because this is about sharing his life I'm sorry it's about sharing his life in terms of what he wrote and how it impacts us even today so Stephen wrote and this was July 30th 2013 as the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has reversed losses on the battlefield and Syrian rebels have begun fighting amongst themselves the revolution that the world cheered on has ground to a halt. Foreign journalists no longer call Jablawi and his fellow activists, and most do not dare venture into a country where jihadists are eager to capture them. As a result, the activists, fighters, and humanitarian aid workers who work so hard to cultivate the revolution are now ruminating about where their uprising went awry. And I think this all holds today, looking back. All right, let's begin with you on terms of Actually, um, he was taken August 3rd, which was, only, which was only four days after he wrote that article. All right, I see. Oh, well, you go first, you want to talk about his younger years. Okay. Shirley, I think a lot of people don't know who Stephen was. You know, they've seen horrible pictures that ISIS wanted the world to see, but they didn't understand what was behind this young man and this absolute interest in understanding the Middle East and all things Middle East and going and meeting people in the Arab countries, going to Israel, and in particular, white journalism. Well, when we start out, Stephen was a very rambunctious young man. Okay. He liked to be everywhere and do everything, and actually, 
he had nine lives, <laughs> quite honestly. Uh, he started out, and we'll go back to the first grade where he first got his um, first writing experience at Temple Beth Am in Miami, where he was invited to the writer's lecture. This was something that the school did every year, and uh, first grade. He, it, maybe seven children a year get to go to this writer's luncheon, and parents are also invited. And then from there, he always wrote about, he, he was always writing a story. He liked to write scary stories. And um, I found that very interesting. I said, well, why are you writing scary stories? He says, it intrigues him, it doesn't, you know, he just wanted to do that. I said, okay, and then he put them aside. He'd never finish them, but he, he, he would write them. Uh, from there, as Stephen was, his grandparents were Holocaust survivors, and he would listen to his grandma and his grandpa talk about the atrocities that happened to them, to their families, as they lost everyone in the Holocaust. And here I was, the second generation, and my brother as well, we, we started a new life. He always sat with my father and wanted, my father would always look at the TV and watch Marvin Cow. Uh, <laughs> and yell at the TV, not at Marvin, but yell at, he was so pro-Israel. And um, Stephen John was quite intriguing and wanted to make sure that he always said, one day I'll get to go to Israel as well. And uh, my parents did go to Israel. They loved Israel. Uh, they belonged to organizations to help Israel. And so therefore, when Stephen, okay, so I'm sorry, we, we're gonna go on. And Stephen is now um, attending high school in, at Kimball Union Academy in New Hampshire. And he resurrected the newspaper there with another co-student uh, co and started the, the, the newspaper at Kimball Union Academy. And um, also became editor in chief. Uh, from there, he attended UCF where he wanted to become a journalist. And he wrote and reported for the school newspaper. And if there was something going on in Israel, he reported about that. He also reported about, or the Middle East, or he would report about things that were happening on campus or outside of campus. He was just all over the place. He also, can you hear me? Yeah. Now we oh, can. I'm sorry. Okay. And from there, in his second, probably his second or third year of attending UCF, he went on a birthright trip, which is a trip to Israel, and landed there and never came home. He wanted, I'm sorry, he wanted to be, he wanted to live in Israel, and he wanted to be with the people and learn about the people, and he did. He decided he'd leave UCF, and he attended IDC, where he majored in government and anti-terrorism, and he graduated cum laude. So that was a big thing for him and for us as well. And, uh, and that's that's the story of this of Stephen wanting getting to from one point to another. Of course, there was a whole lot of other stuff in between. And his grandparents were very happy that he made this journey, and we were happy as well, although we were quite scared. And um, this is it. Art. You know, I'm looking at another piece that Stephen wrote, and it's very important, Marvin, because it actually has to do with Russia. And this was um, May 22nd, 2013. And he wrote, many Syrians are puzzled why Russia is propping Assad up. Some believe Moscow is merely trying to remain relevant in a post-Cold War era. Putin needs to be able to say he stood up to American President Barack Obama, explained 46-year-old engineer Salih Mustafa in Al-Bab. He's turning Syria into a graveyard to do it. 
Mustaf and others hold that Putin wants Obama to beseech him for help to illustrate his global importance to Russians. Putin is playing a game with Obama, noted 35-year-old Tamir Riyadh outside of an Aleppo mosque. He's showing his people how tough he is. And kind of it's ironic, because every time he was writing something several years ago, we see things kind of coming back, whether he was in Libya. You know, you talked earlier, Asaf, about going and looking at ISIS in terms of the retraction in, in, in Libya. And here, Stephen was talking about ISIS from Libya, that it was going to actually develop, and there weren't <coughs> any news agencies, and he was extremely frustrated taking those stories. And sad to say, we were really the only news agency the last six months of his life that he wrote for, about 30, 40, between 30 and 40 stories, telling the world about what was really going on at that time. And I remember that last weekend when I didn't hear from him. And it was a nerve-wracking couple of days of not understanding where he was. I spoke to him that last weekend before he went into Syria. And I remember asking him, do you trust your fixer? Stephen was a bit naive, frankly. But on the other hand, he was one of the most brilliant young journalists that we've ever seen in terms of understanding what was happening in front of us. And yet here again, where press plays this vital role in terms of policy, and nobody's listening. So it all comes full circle. And I ask you, Art, it's, you can't bring Stephen back, but you can keep his name in the papers. And one of the things that you're involved in, of course, is your own foundation and helping with students. And you've joined forces with the Media Line in terms of the press and policy student program. Do you think Stephen would be happy in terms of our journalism at the moment? Um, I think it's evolved a little bit more in the last couple of years since he's been gone. Um, you know, we. He was missing for a whole entire year. And in an entire year, uh, we had a media blackout. Uh, clock thing? I'm sorry? Yeah, no. 8 o'clock. Um, how's that? Hang on. Saturday. Saturday. Okay. Eight. Okay. Uh, there was a media blackout. And uh, so nobody even knew that Stephen was in the predicament that he was in. And um, I don't know. Uh, it's. Um, I think you'd be very happy and proud that we're doing what we're doing. You know, we're trying to make a difference in the world now. You know, with his name, and um, you know, he was just trying to make aware of what was going on that nobody else was reporting. That's why he went into Syria. That he he was the voice of the voiceless, and. Um, he was just taken back by all the suffering and the starvation and the, and the children that were suffering and the brain lines and these were all things that really were being reported. Uh, the night before he crossed over into Syria, he uh, was sitting in a cafe with another journalist who was fairly new and um, he said to this journalist that um, he was a little dismayed about reporting and he was tired of being um, tear gassed and, and beat up and, and so forth. And this was his last trip that he was going to make. That he really wanted to uh, change his course in life. He wanted to come home. He wanted to. Uh, uh, go back and get his master's, have a family, nine to five job, and um, and then the next day he crossed over and, and disappeared. Uh, really didn't find out about Stephen until I started to speak to the people that really knew Stephen. You know, you, you look at your children and they're just your children. They're, you know, you're always trying to correct them and guide them and um, I never realized how good he really was in the profession. Uh, everybody loved him. They thought he was very humorous. He always had a smile on his face. Um, he was very resourceful. Um, he was actually the first person to stumble upon the Benghazi situation. He was there within a day and a half after um, we lost 
Ambassador Stephen and, and, and that crew. And um, I spoke to him. Well, we spoke almost every day by, by Skype, but I spoke to him right before, and, and uh, he said, Dad, you won't believe you know, I, what I found here. I think it's, I'm a little over my head right here. And uh, in any event, um, he was very good at seeking the truth. And he, after all the guards that were um, on duty that night, they all disappeared. They ran up into the hills back to their villages or huts or whatever it might be. And he tracked them down and individually was able to interview them and got a true story of what really happened in the big Gazi incident. He was on Fox News and he was on CNN. And uh, he reported uh, something completely different than the government was putting out there for, you know, with the cartoons, you know, and all that. Um, he had a very good knack for um, seeking the truth and sitting down with people, and, and they opened up to him. Um, I miss him a lot. You know, I don't know what else to say. Um, you know, I've read a lot of his articles, and I'm just so impressed in, in where he was. And he definitely. Um, was before his time, I think. Yeah, it's just a shame that he's not here today and able to go in with his uh, professional you know, ability of reporting the news and so forth. He read so many stories and nobody would take them, <coughs> except police, a couple of other yeah, papers. He, was, but he wasn't there for the money, that's for sure. Yeah, he was well, lucky he was right. in this. <laughs> it didn't work. He hundred dollars an article when he was on base. Well, we did one. But that's not the point. No, no. no. But he loved what he did. And he made a mark in this world, and he'll live on forever. But I do have to tell one story, which which um, she didn't talk about when he was in high school. When he did resurrect the paper, oh, um, yeah. he always made it a habit of sitting with different people every day. You know, it was a boarding school, and uh, so therefore everybody has to eat together, and there's a lunch room. And he made it a point to sit at a different table and talk to a different person at every meal, mm -hmm. um, which is intriguing in itself. I mean, he was so interested in everybody that was, you know, at the school, some of the uh, foreign exchange students, which there was quite a few. And um, he was able to really report on what was going on on the campus. And I found that very, very unique. And, um, he was compelled at a very, very young age to, you know. And then he started to write about things that were off campus, things that were happening in, in the next city over, in the town. And then he was talking about the, the government. And he was like, really? And uh, the paper grew from like a single page to um, seven or eight pages. You know, with editorials, and uh, it was all due to him. And that this was a newspaper that um, was non-existent for a couple of years because nobody knew how to, to start it up. And then when he hit the campus, uh, uh, you know, he just found his passion. You know. Well, I think it's important to celebrate his name, to remember Stephen, yes. to understand that it's important to get young students trained. As a matter of fact, two of the universities that have partnered with the Media Line is Florida Atlantic University, as well as the University of Miami, Correct. King's College in London, uh, Middle East Studies Department, Al Quds in the Palestinian Territories. Uh, there's also in Houston and Denver, and a whole long line of other universities ready to partner with us. What's very exciting, too, is actually one of the stories with one of the Florida Atlantic University students was quite interesting. He was determined to do a local global story. Because, you know, you think it's easy to write about the Middle East, so we kind of try to push the envelope and try to suggest to students to kind of go out of their comfort zone and find something that maybe might resonate. So Thomas Childs was one of the young students who's been doing a mentorship distance learning program with us, and actually Michael was his mentor. Interestingly enough, it was a story he didn't complete. And we sent it back several times and said, this is not finished. And he was busy, and we just kept on him. Finally, he finished the story. 
and it had to do with um, a young person that he interviewed for the Miami Jewish Film Festival. And interestingly enough, he wrote to us, I would also like to thank you for not giving up on me when my first draft was not up to par. After going back and reading my first draft again, I was embarrassed at how weak and lacking it was. Your feedback helped me better understand what can make a strong article. It's about an emotional connection with a person. That's what the reader will relate to. This is something I'll take into account in my new position at the school paper. Here we go again. I hope to complete some strong student profiles this semester, and I will apply the skills I learned while interviewing Naftali from my article. And thank you again for the opportunity. And by the way, we were looking at Facebook. Michael said, wait, let's look at this. We're proud to announce that Naftali Rosenberg is the recipient of our second annual Jerusalem Film Workshop Scholarship. Get to know our winner by reading the exclusive interview at the Media Line. <laughs> well, every story is different. Every person is different. I hope you kind of got a glimpse of our world in journalism. I'd like to say journalism is not Democrat. Journalism is not Republican. It is really supposed to be bar labels. I hope that everyone considers getting involved in what we do in training young students for the future because this is our future. This is how we take back journalism. There are people here who can help you if you're interested in supporting it. And for people online, we welcome you to join the media line and read all about it. Thank you so much for this evening, and I thank the Overseas Press Club. Let me just say thank you so much to you and Michael for what you've accomplished and to everybody who participated, Marvin, Peter, Art and Shirley, of course, and Liana and Asha and Katie, our future. And uh, I don't know what everybody was thinking here about this extraordinary program, but I know I kept thinking about my friends who I wish had been here. And uh, on that note, I want to say that I think that thanks to Chad Bouchard, that this program will be available so you, online, on I think on the media line and on the Overseas Press Club website. So you can send a link, uh, it won't be up in the next 10 minutes, but you will be able to send a link to your friends so they can see this. And it was really a great, and I so hope thousands of more people will see it. Anyway, thank you so much. It was a real honor for the OPC to co-host us. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.